So I've often joked on this show that uh, I'm not a really good businessman. I was a really good salesman and I had a wife who never let me spend any money. So I had money in the bank. When I went on my own to become a coach, they taught me how to do some really miraculous things. I make a difference in people's lives. What they didn't teach me and what they didn't tell me was that I was going into business for myself, that I was going to be an entrepreneur and have to run a business. I love coaching. I love helping people. I love making a difference. But they didn't know that I was going to have to look at a P&L and I was going to have to figure out how to market myself and how to, how to do all the things that go into running a business. And then I read a book by my next guest. And then I read, actually, I read both his books at the same time, listened while I walked with the dog, read the book in the morning. Uh, and uh, I learned that I too can be a businessman. I too can be an entrepreneur and a great coach. So Jay Samet is an international best-selling author, a dynamic entrepreneur and entrepreneur who is widely recognized as one of the world's leading experts on disruption and innovation. He is described by Wired Magazine as having the coolest job in the industry. He raises millions of dollars, uh, advises Fortune 100 companies. Uh, he's the author of Disrupt You, Master Personal Transformation, Seize Opportunity, and Thrive in the Era of Endless Innovations. He's holding up the book, even though this is a podcast, but that's great because we are going to put up the video. And then the other really cool book is Future Proofing You, 12 Truths for Creating Opportunity, <laughs> Maximizing Wealth, and Controlling Your Destiny in, the, uh, in an Uncertain World. And I found Jay on Tom Bilio's uh, incredible podcast, and I'm going to put the links to his podcast where he's been guests three times so that you can get the crux of the thing. We're going to talk a little more humanistically on this show. Jay, thank you for being here. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks for making the time. Like I said, you, you know, you you just shifted my world in such a way that uh, you made it accessible and, you know, uh, disrupting you and then fruit you proofing you is kind of to me like uh, Brene Brown's Daring Greatly. Uh, and then, and then um, now I forgot the name of the, the second book, so Daring Greatly, people dare greatly, right? They start businesses and then they fall on their, on their face and then there's rising strong. In disrupting you, you like, what can you go and do? How can you go be different? How can you, you know, bet on yourself? And then I'm kind of left with, how do I do that? And then you come up with future proofing you, which is a 12 step pro process to actually building a business. Do you see it? Do you see it that way? Do you see that progression between the two so, books? So I wrote Disrupt You to pay it forward. You know, if you would have told me growing up that dozens of friends would become self made billionaires with a B, I had never even met a millionaire. I, I didn't understand anything. And I realized school prepares us to be factory workers or to make someone else's dream come true. So once I noticed a pattern and I noticed I could teach it, I thought that'd be the only book I ever wrote. And I get, as opposed to being a NASDAQ company CEO where your inbox is filled with, I hate you and we're suing the company and all the problems. I get what I call love letters. I get emails from people from all over the world. I've heard from people in 140 countries to help disrupt you change them. But I got an email that bugged me. It was from a millennial that said, this is all motivational, but I could never do this. And that just ate at me. What was my failing that I couldn't communicate to a certain sector? I'm and by the way, I'm 59 and I thought the same thing. I can't do this. And right. then, then you answer. So, so I tried a crazy experiment. There's, there's millions of, of self-help books out there, but no one had ever said, I'm going to take an immigrant who grew up on welfare, mentor him one day a week for a year, give him no cash and no contacts, and spoiler alert for people reading uh, Future Proof You, he becomes a self-made millionaire in 11 months. And so I broke down those mentoring sessions into 12 truths. If anyone follows these 12 truths, they'll have the same results. This isn't a get rich quick scheme. This is breaking down the process of what you have to do, no matter what business you're thinking about. And in the case of this young man, Ben Clancy, he was willing to work harder for one year than most people were willing to in order to live the rest of his life in a manner that most people were unable to. Mm. So instead of spending five hours a day looking at your phone and watching TV and watching the game and all those things, daytime was for making sales calls, nighttime was for doing the work. And, uh, you know, by the end of his first month, he made almost $70,000. He could have walked across the ocean. He never thought this type of world was possible. You mentioned, you mentioned that he 
uh, that he, you know, so, so you pick this guy and I, I love what I love when you say, you know, he thinks he was the only one uh, that you just picked him randomly and you kind of you, you, you had a you had a group of people and you chose him because of uh, some some um, attributes that he had. But you so got a little little backwards. I, I there's a psychological uh, phenomenon called the Pygmalion effect. A uh, professor went to school, tested all the students, told, told the teachers three students would be super learners, super achievers, would kill it that year. At the end of the year, those three kids excelled beyond belief. But the professor lied. He just pulled three names out of a hat. But if you te- treat people special and you tell them that they're special, they become special. So to get Vin from this mindset of, of failure to success, I basically told him I interviewed over 100 people when, in fact, he was the only candidate that I ever met. And I told him out of all the candidates, he was the only one that had all the attributes. And so even if he didn't internalize the growth mindset, he figured if this old successful dude thought he had it, then he'd go along with it. Great. Thank you for correcting me that you're right. That's backwards now. But you also said that like he, he wasn't completely motivated in the, it wasn't until the first month when he saw some success that he really started to be. In yeah, he didn't internalize it. So the, the truth, number one of the 12 truths is you have to have a growth mindset. You know, simply put, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So most people go around with the I can't mentality. Their parents or teachers, other well-wishers, try to shield them from pain and failure by steering them away from things that they thought they couldn't do. When in fact, it is that pain and failure that propels you forward. You have to fail to become successful. Because failing means you're trying things that haven't been tried. If you're going to do what everybody else is doing, there's somebody already doing it. So why should you ever get the job? Why should you ever be successful? It's by filling a void, by doing something that somebody else isn't doing, by solving a problem. Entrepreneurs don't sell things, they solve things. As I like to say, no one ever went into a hardware store to buy a quarter inch drill bit. What they wanted was a quarter inch hole. They bought the drill bit to solve their problem. So if you start thinking about what problems you have, you're halfway to success. If you don't have any problems, I can't help you. You have an exercise in your workbook uh, that you know you basically write three down, write down three problems uh, every day, and after thirty days, you have a list of ninety problems, challenges that you found in your world. Now, right. pick five that you actually care about, that you're willing to do something about, and that's how you get people to start creatively thinking who maybe haven't been before, because that's that's the other progression that I'm really. Uh, enamored with with your work. So I don't, if you don't mind, I'd like to take a couple steps back because right now sure. we're recording this and we're just coming out of the COVID pandemic. Uh, you know, the vaccines are working. We're going back to work. I've been to some functions now and uh, the world's uh, happening. And as you said, it's either by choice or circumstance, your job is going to get disrupted. People now know that yeah. their jobs aren't safe. So with the uncertainty, what, with the uncertainty that's going on in the world, what conversations are you having? What are you noticing now with people uh, now that they're forced to look at their career mortality and that, that basically their own success is in their own hands when they didn't think about that in the, you know, forever, like they didn't have that growth mindset. They just were aware. So, so a lot of people that, that continued to go to a job that barely paid them to show up and they didn't care about and couldn't ever let them live the life that they want, did it for the security. But it wasn't security that was robbing ambition, it was the illusion of security. What the pandemic finally showed is there is no security. You know, I've been telling people this for for years, okay? Over the next five years, half of all jobs disappear in the US. Let that sink in for a second. That's massive carnage. And it's not just, okay, self-driving trucks, so there's no truck drivers. It's AI systems so you don't need auditors and accountants and middle management and as many lawyers. And, and it goes on and on. And as you raise the minimum wage, anything that can be automated will be automated. But that means massive change. And anytime there's change, there's opportunity. If things stay the same way, you know, in the Middle Ages, you're born a serf, you work somebody's land, and then you die. There's not a lot of room for you to become successful. In a world where you have a phone that you're one click away from 7 billion people, and there's a self-made billionaire every, now it's 26 hours, pre-pandemic it was every 48 hours. Mm. So every two days, someone has figured out how to become a billionaire. They didn't go to the right school, they didn't go to college, 
We didn't come from major thing. And what we learned in the pandemic is you don't have to live in a major city or even a first world country because you can create a virtual company and work from anywhere and hire the best people from everywhere. You don't have to hire the best people in your town because quite frankly, your town may not have the best people. So amazing time. And the pace of change in this era of endless innovation is accelerating, which really means more and more opportunity. Or if you're stuck like a deer in headlights, you're roadkill. Because what got you to where you are in life will not get you to through to the next level. And that's guaranteed. You have to commit to lifelong learning. You're going to need a series of mentors. In Future Proofing You, I teach people how to get the mentors for each stage of their life. Nice. So they, that, that, those are the people I care about. Those are the people I'm thinking about right now. There's a plenty of entrepreneurs and real go-getters with growth mindset that'll, be, that'll, that'll pivot and work through whatever's happening. And there's a whole bunch of people that I love and care about who have never thought this way. And the thought of having to go out and fend for themselves and live by their wits is terrifying. And Life is terrifying. You know, and, and you. I, yeah. One of, one of the secrets that I share in Future Proofing You is that this, the people that you're going to try to sell to, the people that you're going to try to get investment from, the people that you're going to try to get to follow you and join your company, all share those same fears. So fear can be a positive tool to leverage you to success if you learn how to use it, not in the mafioso, hey, buy this thing or I break your knees, um, but in understanding what motivates everybody. And for some reason, you know, it all starts in, in elementary school that we teach a scarcity mentality. We teach people there's only so much money. I have to get money from you for me to get money. And when someone else gets a job, they're taking my opportunity. When another country gets a job, when immigrants get, and you have this, 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 this dog eat dog, you know, existence, which is misery. On the other hand, if you realize that most money is made from thin air, it's not made by the Federal Reserve, it's not printed in the mint. If I started a new company and I said, Mark, we're going to sell you 10% for $10,000, what do I now have? I have 10,000 in cash and 90,000 in stock that didn't exist. I can buy things with that, I can sell things. So that's how Jeff Bezos could lose money year after year after year for a decade at Amazon and come out the backside as the richest man in history. So unless you understand that now, if you buy into that, there is no scarcity. Now you understand why people want to be mentors, why they want to be part of the solution, because you're creating something that wasn't there. Mm. You're adding value to the world. There's tons of professions that add no value and just are cost. Doesn't sound like a fun way to live a life. You know, I believe the purpose of life is to live a life of purpose, you know? After I became successful, my soapbox was I watched, especially pandemic years, the middle class got wiped out globally. And the only way you have peace and stability and democracy is a strong middle class. And the only way you have a middle class is by people creating jobs. And the only people who create jobs are entrepreneurs. So unless we start teaching people, and I also work with governments to make their policies more entrepreneurial, and I don't do this to make a dime. I'm not, I'm not selling coaching. I'm not, I'm not selling t-shirts. There's no mastermind. You cannot pay me. All that I'm trying to do is unlock what's in people so that they can have a better life. So, uh, so I've had a job all my life uh, and now my job goes away. And I read some self-help books and I get some motivation to go start a business. And then I read something from you and you, and you start talking about, you know, algorithm shifts and, and deal structures and all this stuff. And then I short circuit, right? This is a little overwhelming for me. I'm trying to figure things out. I finally got the, the guts to go bet on myself. Maybe I even have an idea. Where else do I, where do I start? Where do I start to figure out who I am and how I can do this when I've never done that before? So, so as we talked about earlier, the purpose of that 30 day exercise is not just for you to come up with a good business idea. But if ideas and businesses are based on solving problems, after one or two days, most people say, I have no more problems. I've listed nine problems. There's, there's nothing else. Because we live on autopilot. We don't pay attention to the moment by moment inconveniences because that's the way it always is. And we develop habits. 
And those habits calcify until we no longer change. Um, I'm guilty of this the next person. We all have habits. I remember, I don't know, a decade ago, my son was looking for his first apartment. We're driving around, see a building with the sign. I go, write down that number, we'll call. And he takes his phone, he takes a picture. Now, I take pictures with my phone, but I have a habit of writing things down and don't think of using that phone in a different way. Mm. Which means that a younger generation doesn't have the bad habits of past technology. And they may come up with a solution that seems so simple and obvious that no one else came up with it. So the next step, and this is the critical step that most people get wrong. Most people then fall in love with their idea and work hard to see to fruition. And when I speak in front of live audiences, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people, everybody always wants to come up and tell me their idea afterwards. And I warn them ahead of time, I'm going to tell you why your idea sucks because your idea does suck, okay? All ideas suck, okay? The purpose in the beginning before you start spending money and learning the lessons of why it sucks is to talk to as many people that can find holes in it so you can start patching it and going deeper into the forest so you get past that obvious idea stage to a place where no one that hasn't done the work will find that solution. And then when you find that and crystallize that goal, raising money, finding distribution, getting sales, getting PR, all that just falls into place because you have what I call a zombie idea, an idea that can't be killed. I, I, I just want to reiterate that when you when you do the work, when you find when you get people honest around you to tell poke holes in your idea to really boil it down, then it really the the rest of it becomes simpler. I don't know how. And, and I'll, yeah, I'll give you one that a seventeen year old just did. This is my my new favorite example of why I'm such a failure and and how how amazing people can be. She's in high school, has to do the science fair project. You know, we all did them. Mine was the stereotype, most famous one. I did make a baking soda and vinegar volcano. Okay, that was it. Okay, no thought, who cares? Okay. This girl had somebody uh, that had recently had surgery and she learned that the number four cause of death in this country is not disease or anything. It's being in a hospital. It's infection. So when you have surgery and stitches, stitches, you know, wounds get infected. So so she came up with this idea, this crazy idea. Why not have suture stitches that change color if they're infected? <laughs> so she played with, with some string and she played with beet juice, which has a different pH balance than human skin. And I won't bore you with the science. Smart enough to go get a patent for this thing. Wins the National Science Fair, whatever, but is saving hundreds of thousands of lives while she's in high school by solving a problem that has plagued mankind for centuries. So there's no shortage of problems. There's a shortage of people trying to solve problems. And an entrepreneur isn't somebody that buys something for $1 and sells it for $2, okay? That's a middleman. And the middlemen are getting crushed, okay? Mm -hmm. When during the pandemic, you couldn't go to stores, all those people that were still held out, holdouts that weren't buying from Amazon, they're buying from Amazon, right? And all those franchisees that said, okay, now the people have food delivered, they're, they're coming, you know, the, the Uber Eats drivers coming to my, you know, McDonald's location to bring the food to those people. No, there's now ghost kitchens where one kitchen in a warehouse has Pizza Hut and McDonald's and a Chinese restaurant and, and everything else you could think of. So you don't need those middlemen. So we have tremendous efficiencies that come with the scale and with data. Every business, one of, the, one of the, the 12 truths, every business is a high-tech startup. Whether you're opening a restaurant, whether you're opening a clothing line, you have to think of it in those terms. If you're opening a, a, a coaching business, you are in a high-tech startup business. Why? How are you going to reach new clients? You're going to be using social media or Google ads. You know? How I, I'm shocked at the synergies. You're right. How do you master that when you're competing against every other business trying to do the same thing? In the height of everybody using Google, I, I, I was CEO of a startup ad platform that figured out how to get better engagement. 
So we're going up against Google for ad dollars. I mean, plain and simple. Fast forward the story, you know, I, the company was, was failed, had 30,000 in revenue when it came in and took it over. 18 months later, News Corp bought it for $200 million. We solved the problem, a massive problem. And since people weren't buying TV commercials or watching TV commercials, if you're a large media company, you need an answer. And that's the other thing that people don't understand when they see these headlines of somebody has a startup that makes no profit and it sells for hundreds of millions and billions of dollars. It, it just blows their mind. But look at it from the other side. CEOs today have a very short shelf life. They're like a piece of, of cheese. You know, They have an expiration date stamped on them. And so to invest your company's overhead in building a product that comes out a year or two from now when you're not there, there's no payback for that for the CEO. And the CEOs actually don't get paid a lot. They have an incentive plan that is insane. If the stock hits a certain price, they literally back up the Brinks truck to my house. So what am I going to focus on? And I'm not, I'm not taking a public CEO job again. So I, I'll tell you, when they tell you they they're care about the shareholders, the employees, and the customers, BS. The board doesn't care about those things. The board wants that stock price to move. So if every 16 weeks you can move the stock price, you get millions of dollars. So you can either move the stock price by being a genius like Elon Musk or Steve Jobs, somebody creating great innovative products. That's a lot of work. Or you just trim every cost. You don't develop any future product or whatever. You have no overhead. So you're killing the company, but you're hitting your numbers. That's what's going on in corporate America. But here's where that helps the entrepreneur. They now have nothing in the pipeline to sell because they won't spend the years of losses to develop it. So if you come up with a solution, that instantly lets them hit their numbers by just buying your company. And then they have the profits of that the next quarter. Bingo. So every CEO that's in trouble will try to do an acquisition to get his butt out of the vice. So it goes back to their fear. Number one purpose of anybody in corporate America is self-preservation. Their fear of being downsized, their fear of a merger, their fear of being replaced, because those fears are real. I mean, I'll get in trouble for it, but I, I was brought in on a, 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 a very large uh, tens of billions of dollars merger between two giant entities. It was in the news. And when the chairman of the acquiring company said, we bought this other company because there's $2 billion in synergies, I literally laughed out loud. I said, you know, that's not true. So what do you really want to accomplish here now that you got your headlines and you got your bonus? I mean, you know, I call it the way it is. And funny thing is now two years later, they're selling off that asset at a loss of hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and people go, why could companies make that stupid decision? Well, the guy who was CEO, the guy who's now lost his job, mm -hmm. that one bonus of his was over a hundred million dollars. So that was a smart deal for him. Again, back, back to trickle down to us is that people are looking for your ideas once you have a good yeah. idea. And you no know. one's going to steal your idea. That's, that's the other thing I suppose. Like, oh, I have this idea. Oh, I can't tell anybody. It is so hard for you to get your company to go. You could stand in Times Square with, with the cure for cancer, right? <laughs> and no one's going to steal it from you, okay? And, and so you have to get people past that. Um, you know, I'm chairman of a company that somebody came to me that solved a huge problem, an engineer that worked for me 20 years before. And I said, wow, this will help the entire world. I'm morally obligated to say yes and jump in and, and help run another company again. Uh, but there's so much that we can improve in this world. So you just have to make the slightest improvement. In Future Proofing You, I talk about a mom who's my hero, okay? It's the middle of the week. Every, every parent can relate to this. Their kids making their poster board presentation for school the next day, kids in junior high, and the little girl messes it up. She's crying, mommy, mommy, go to the store, get me another piece of poster board, please, 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 please. So the mom relents, but before she goes and gives her the poster board, she takes a yardstick and she makes little faint lines on it so the girl can write something neat to do the story real short. It dawns on her, why don't they sell this? She gets a patent for this goes to the largest maker of poster board, and she makes about $5 million. No employees, no fundraising. 
no having to figure out sales and marketing. She solved a problem, an obvious problem to anybody who would watch the kid mess up a piece of poster board. It really is that simple. And, you know, the population has exploded so much that we don't even understand the scale of when we put something on the internet. How, you know, we don't have to have everybody buy our product. We have to have a subset because there's just so many people that we can- But, but, but the flip side is you now have tools between social media and Google and everything where you don't have to market to everybody to find that subset. If you have something for left-handed blind golfers, okay, you can market just to them. So it is amazing. And this is where crowdfunding comes in. There's no gatekeepers blocking you from capital. You can go straight to potential customers that say, oh my God, I would like this. And instantly write a check. And crowdfunding isn't this mythology that you throw something up there magically, you know, $50 million comes your way. No, it's targeting and marketing to that potential customer. And what a great validation before you go try to make a product to see, would anybody buy it? And would they buy it at that price point? I know companies that have tons of money to do with themselves that do a crowdfunding to test market. So you can do it. In Future Proofing You, I also want to get rid of some of the myths. Being brighter doesn't make you wealthier. Going to four-year university for the first time in history statistically doesn't make you wealthier. What makes you wealthier? Having a positive mindset is the start. But there's only two things you need to be successful. Insight and perseverance. If you disrupt you and future-proofing you, show you how to get the insights to have better deal flow than a venture capital firm. Future-proofing you walks you through the step-by-steps. And one of the key myths that, that I should have shattered earlier that I didn't talk about in Disrupt You that I got to future-proofing you, yeah, I think it's truth number eight, don't fly solo. There are no self-made people. That is BS. I, you know, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, probably you know, the most revered scientist of all time, even he said he accomplished what he did because he was standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. Okay. Name a billion dollar company with one person. Right. So, how do you build a team? How do you find these people? How do you do it? Mother Teresa had a mentor, Oprah had a mentor, Zuckerberg had a mentor. Even when Bill Gates suddenly shot with Microsoft to become a multi-billionaire as a kid, his mother was smart enough to know, you're gonna need a mentor. And he's like, hey, I'm king of the world. What do, I, what do I need? And she said, go meet Warren Buffett because I think as being one of the richest people on the planet, you may have some problems that other people can't relate to, you know, whether it's security or this, that, or the other thing. And they became, you know, uh, Warren has been a close friend of Bill's and, and a great mentor. So. Learning how to find those people that want you to succeed, that can get you to the next level, that will do it for free because it validates their life, their experience, and their knowledge set. Very key. How about that? But how about also partnerships where people have some of the expertise that you don't have? So, you know, Absolutely. visionaries well, and implementers and that kind of thing. Well, the greatest example of that is, you know, everybody listening to my voice has written as much computer code as Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, who built the first trillion dollar company, Apple Computer, he wasn't a coder. He gave half of his startup, that, that, that stock that I talked about that you make out of, out of thin air, to Wozniak, who happened to be, at that moment in history, probably the smartest, most on top of computing individual on the planet. And Wozniak couldn't sell his way out of a shopping bag. I mean, so together, they became an amazing, history-changing, life-changing team. Um, Many people start their company with a mirror image of themselves. Somebody they get along with, somebody with similar background. Worst thing you can do. When I teach this at, at the university level, and I've had uh, you know, students, uh, best, best student, do 100 million their first year. So let that sink in. They tend to drop out of school and the university gets mad at me, but I go, wait till you see who endows you with you know, uh, naming a building after. But in my class, I would take 
engineers and business students, and they had to pair up together. Because the business students all have what they think is a totally thought out idea, but when they realize they can't explain it in language that an engineer can follow in a step-by-step -step because they don't think that way. And, you know, engineers implement. They don't start by nature with, here's a blank canvas. There, there was some reason for them to go to that blank canvas. So it's really an exercise in communicating. So, so I just got talked into this by readers of Future Proof Meal. I'm launching on July 1st uh, a, a Facebook group for, to try to take a thousand people and make a thousand millionaires over the next year. Wow. And we're taking people from all over the world. There's no cost, nobody's exchanging money. But the goal here is there's not gonna be a thousand great business ideas that become a thousand businesses, not gonna happen. What's gonna happen is by being in that group and talking with each other, go, hey, Mark, I really like your idea, it's a lot better than mine. I'm good at marketing or I'm good at coding. I'm good at this. I'm good at that. Can, let's build a team. And so now suddenly you'll have virtual companies that are cross border, cross age group, cross gender, cross race, cross religion, because all those things are just artifices that separate us. We all want the same thing. We want a better life for ourselves and our children. We want a healthy planet. We want a peaceful existence. You know, it's doable. And that's, that's, that's the bottom line that I get from what you have to say. You know, it's sweat equity over, over intellect and it's doable. Anybody can do it. You just have to make that decision to do it. In your, in your workbooks, like you ask questions like, are you willing to change? Are you capable of that? And do you believe in yourself, right? And if the answer is yes, then you can move forward. And if you can't, you got to do the work to find out that you can in order to be able to compete. And, I mean, and you have one advantage over most people. You literally were homeless. You hit rock bottom. So you don't have a fear of what happens if I give up my job. You know what happens and you're still here, right? Totally. totally. And I, I do coach people not to do what I do, uh, to do be a little more thoughtful because quitting your job it, when you have it, elderly it, parents and kids and stuff like that, a little scary. It, 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 it's, it's not the way, you know, I have more scars on my back than anybody. I mean... I've been screwed over, you know, more times, but each one taught me something that propelled me forward. Would I like to skip all those lessons and become a billionaire in my twenties? Sure. Would I be an obnoxious person? Yes. Um, but here's what people don't understand if fear is holding them back right now. Okay. I hate when people, when motivational speakers online, and you know who they are, tell you fear is not real, fear is in your head, fear is BS, fear, 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 you can overcome it. You can't. We are biologically hardwired to be fearful. It is why you have the blessings to be alive today. It's because your great great grandfather, Ugg, in the cave, when he saw the saber toothed tiger, he ran and the other guy didn't. That's why he was able to have offspring, okay? Yeah. So you cannot change the fact that you're fearful. So let's talk about your fears. Your fear of losing your job, fear of going homeless, fear of losing your money, fear of losing other people's money, fear of public embarrassment, okay? Fear of you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not strong enough, you're not tall enough, whatever it is. Pretend for a second you're thinking about those fears, Mark, and you're walking down the sidewalk. 18 wheel, semi loaded with nuclear weapons, breaks her out, is screeching across the sidewalk towards you. What are you thinking about at that exact moment? Uh, safety, how do I move? How do you get out of there? Right. You're, it's an existential threat. Your life is over if you don't move, correct? Correct. So you can prioritize fears. You're not thinking about those other fears, okay? All right? You're not thinking about, oh. I don't want to ruin my shoes in, 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 in the puddle. If I have to step in the puddle, you're like, I don't care about my shoes. I, I, I got to get out of this truck. Well, now go back to your job. If you're in a job that just pays you enough to show up and not enough to care, you're not going anywhere and you're not learning and growing. You trade a day, a week, a month, a year. You're going to go by and wake up one day and your whole life went by just like that truck. You threw away your life because you were afraid. Now, if you don't believe me, go talk to your grandparents, go talk to 
seniors in the senior center and ask them their biggest regret in life. And it's never what they failed at. It's what they failed to try. Always. So what bothers me about society right now is we have a whole generation, Gen X and Gen Y, that are coming out of college with a mortgage but no house. They're so in debt that that debt enslaves them so that they cannot take the risks when they don't have kids and mortgage and braces and summer camp and all that overhead to try things that they may learn from. Because here's the other thing. Even when you fail, you don't end up where you started. You either earn or you learn, but either way, you're better off. And everybody fails. I mean, my, my go-to great example is guys I worked with early in my career had a genius idea. Hook up a computer to traffic lights to get rid of traffic. It was called Traffo Data. Flawless idea. Perfectly executed. Smartest guys that could, could work on it. No city planner understood what they were talking about. Traffo Data went bankrupt and Bill Gates and Paul Allen started a second company, Microsoft. Walt Disney's first company, Bust. Henry Ford's first company, Bust. The problem we see today in a social media driven existence where people spend five and a half hours a day on their phone is they're not actually interacting and seeing other people's lives. They're seeing the greatest hits edited life with fake filters where you assume everybody else is living this great life except you. Everybody else has a carefree existence except you. Why are you so small and so failing when in fact, we're all the same? No one was born with destiny to, to greatness. You make yourself great. And so why we teach what we teach for the past hundred years in schools to prepare people for a life that doesn't exist anymore, mm. I don't know. But I'm so thankful I learned trigonometry because it helps me during trigonometry season. I mean, <laughs> you know, there's a great rock lyric when I think back to all the crap I learned in high school. They teach us about taxes. They teach us about property. I had a teacher reach out to me that, that loved Disrupt You. And she taught in an inner city where the kids had two choices after high school. Would you like fries with that or go to prison? I mean, they were really nothing. And she wanted to teach kids that you could be entrepreneurs. So I gave her, I said, go ahead. She turned it into a high school course. She made student workbooks and she won teacher of the year. She's changing lives. And I leaned on... Uh, Joel Packard said, hey, you guys are known for printing. Why don't you print copies of all these workbooks to give out at all the boys and girls clubs? Yeah, maybe only 1% it'll change, but that's a million points of life. So you, ha uh, you have answered or spoke about everything on my list before I asked it. I didn't even have to ask questions. So I'm going to ask Sorry. a personal question. No, I okay. love it. This is this is, this is, you, you're, you're probably of all the people I've ever interviewed, uh, most researched because I didn't think I would be interviewing you. I've just been, you know, paying attention to everything that you've been putting out. Uh, so Admit that you're a stalker. No. I'm totally, I'm totally, I'm totally, I'm totally a stalker. <laughs> uh, and you know, the other thing I'm, I'm really falling in love with is finding you guys who have really conquered the world in several ways and then are really dedicating your life to making an impact and making a difference with your skill set and your gifts. And it just fills my heart to meet people who are doing things that are changing people's world. So thank you for that. It's very healing to meet people like you. Per I want to ask a, a personal question. You talk right. about not being a, a, a physical athlete kind of person. And then later in life, you decided you wanted to get in shape. And that was, that was a challenge for you. Make yourself a little more human for me. Can you talk about that a little bit? And sure. How that came about and what that was like for you? And what's it like now, a few years later? Okay, so got to go back to when I'm four years old, my mother did want me around. And so she forged my birth certificate to say that I was a year older so she could drop me off at school. Um, she hated that I put that story in the book that the whole world knows she's a forger. Um, uh, but what this meant was I was a full year and a half smaller than everybody, and I was asthmatic. So if you put those two things together, I couldn't compete in sports. I couldn't do anything. I was, you know, I was always smaller and couldn't and less coordinated. So I tuned it out of my life. I hated it. You know, by the time you get to junior high and they have state sanctioned beating up uh, called wrestling, you know, I, I still hold the national championship for 
for getting both shoulders on the mat before the other kid touched me. I mean, um, so, I mean, I literally don't follow a team, don't watch a thing, don't understand it. You know, guys run this way, guys run that way. When esports came out, I understood that. People that could play the game better than you, you like to watch, which is why people watch pro sports. But anyway, so I realized when I was writing uh, Disrupt You that I had um, a preconceived limitation in my mind because at four years old, I was less coordinated than five-year-olds. I think I could kick any five-year-old's ass today, okay? So, so why did I not change that? So I decided to, to break one of those voices in my head that was holding me back. And I happened to have a young man working for me who was on the Olympic wrestling team, gave me a bunch of exercises that put in the gym, did the whole thing. And lo and behold, all of a sudden, I was like, oh, my God, I didn't think this was possible, right? And how, how um, old were you when you when – you, when you, I was 40. 40 you're so you're mid, 40 years old. Crisis. I finally took that belief oh, on. First time in my life that I could do pull-ups, right? You know, I sit there and do, you know, 50 of them. And first time I could do a push-up. First time I could do anything. Now – because I didn't have a passion to go and ooh, I want to play baseball or join a basketball because I didn't care about that. The one physical activity that I had a passion for, um, I, you may know, paid my way through college and still am a performing magician. I love circus stuff. So I wanted to be a trapeze artist. So I literally found uh, coaches both here and on the East Coast and learned to fly through the air. And it was the most terrifying and exhilarating thing I've ever achieved. So thought, anything the flying through the air, by the way, is not what was terrifying for me. It was leaning forward to grab the trapeze arm. That was, that to me was the almost impossible thing. with Trapeze. Yeah. And then um, the other thing that I did, which was absolutely insane, but once you do trapeze, you realize how easy it is. It's called teeter board. That's where the one guy stands on one side of the seesaw, the other guy jumps, you fly up and you're on a guy's shoulder. You're just basically, if you're, if you don't move a muscle and you stay stiff, like dead weight, easiest thing in the world to pull off. If you freak out, you're going to splat on the concrete. But anyway, I digress. But <laughs> the lessons are that we are malleable. Mm. We're not hardwired. You, there's, there's been twin studies of the twin that talks first ends up being more verbal because they get more attention. The other one doesn't catch up. And so you can change anything about yourself and you can become things that you don't believe are possible. And I had this happen to me during the pandemic. When the pandemic struck, I went from flying around, you know, 200, 250,000 miles a year all over the world to I'm now going to be locked in my house. And I thought it would be a month or two. I didn't realize it'd be 400 days. So I said, how can I show the silver lining to those people that don't get the affliction? There's always a silver lining. Destruction isn't about what happens to you. It's about how you respond. So I decided to open my privacy a little bit more and show people something that I've done my whole life, which is art. I'm a watercolorist. I paint. And so I decided I'd put up a painting a day to show people what you can do instead of just watch Tiger King or whatever everybody was doing. That was my sole motivation. No other motivation. I put myself out there. What happened, I couldn't have even anticipated. People liked my work. People shared my work. People saw my work. Art agent contacts, galleries contact. Next thing you know, a solo show at the prestigious Richard Tattinger Gallery in Manhattan and my art being bought by famous art collectors, which blows my mind. I always picture these, when they tell me the name of who bought it, that they have a crack in the wall in their bathroom, right? And my picture just fits to cover the crack. Um, I've had commission work since then. I'm now a professional artist. I got to tell you, at, you know, 16, 17, I would have loved to go on and become a professional artist, but you can't make a living. You, you, you don't know how to connect the dots. I, I was never going to go that route. Never too late. That's the other thing. There's been first-time millionaires in their 60s and 70s. There's been, you know, first-time billionaires. I mean, Jack Ma, Alibaba, the bigger than Amazon, you know, uh, retailer, his company was five years into it and he still didn't even own a laptop or a computer. He didn't know how to use a computer. He knew the internet was something important. He knew he could hire those people. My first company, I didn't know how to do anything. I just hired the people that knew how to. I started a company for a dollar. I printed business cards, but I was smart enough at 21 not to make myself CEO. Who's going to hire a company with the 21-year-old CEO. I just made myself head of sales. They didn't have to meet the boss. 
boss didn't exist. You know, your, both of your books are just uh, sto- anecdote after anecdote. So real life stories of real people, including yourself, just, you know, pulling rabbits out of the hat, being creative, figuring things out and, and getting the win, no matter what it takes. Because uh, if you don't have those stories, it is so opaque of how people get to be where they are. Elvis Presley was a truck driver, then he was this famous rock and roll singer. So if I start driving trucks, will I become a famous rock and roll singer? I mean, there's nobody telling me how to connect the dots. And when I was in college, I I, uh, wrote for a school paper. One of the perks was I got to interview the famous people who came to campus. And I was obsessed with this at that age when you're trying to figure out the world. How did, you know, all these famous people, how did you, at one point you were where I am. And how did it get to, and what I noticed was there is no escalator to the top, there is no shortcut, and there is no set path, okay? And that's what I hated about most of the other books that tell you, this is how I did it after World War II, I came out irrelevant. What is, is breaking down the value chain of how you function and how the world functions to allow you to connect the dots. Because you don't, to do a journey of a thousand miles, you don't have to see the destination. You just have to know where the destination is and just know what the next step is. And then you just keep on going. And it's not a straight line. There's going to be setbacks. There's going to be hurt. In Future Proofing You, Ben's business was knocked over middle of the year, no fault of his own for something that had never happened in history. And I thought he was going to throw in the towel. I'm like, he's down for the count. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, okay, so a book about a guy made a half a million dollars isn't so bad. And he was supposed to make 100,000 that month and he comes in dejected. I knew what had happened to the business. And he goes, I only made 96,000 and he was sad. And I'm laughing inside. When you were on welfare, would you ever imagine that you'd be depressed about only making $96,000 in a month? And then when I learned how he did it, that's when I knew that the mindset, the growth mindset had really been internalized. Because the second his business got knocked over, he said, I now see that's not working. What can I try that will? Not, oh, I'm a failure. Oh, this failed. Oh, it's over. Okay, that doesn't work. And I I have been, you know, in those crosshairs, I can't tell you how many times. And my perseverance was driven by the fact that I became a father very young and I wanted my two sons to have a good life. So there was no option to quit. There was no option to give up. There has to be a solution. Um, I will admit that my sons are, have been the same motivation for me when, when the wheels came out from under me several times. It was because I, had, I was a dad that I found a way to try yeah. And so once they grew up and became successful, I, I lost my motivation to go run another company and go make another million. You know, what's the point? I mean, there, there's literally, you know, I, I, I don't understand people that want to have jets and yachts. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's amazing. You can go anywhere in the world and there's a thing called a hotel. And it's all waiting for you. You don't need a, another house there and you don't need another state. I mean, I just don't understand, but I, I, I digress. First, first world rich people problems. Um, <laughs> but when I looked at what happened to this world, when I watched, especially in January, what happened in, in, in our nation's capital, in the Congress, what I saw were thousands of people feeling left out, left behind, fighting over leftovers. The bottom 140 million Americans own zero. Most have a negative net worth. The majority of people hitting 65 do not have savings. The majority of people do not have enough cash on hand for a thousand dollar emergency. That's not a stable society. So if I have the power to teach people to change their lives and I can do it at scale, I'm willing to give up my time, give up my privacy, spend time writing books, going out speaking, being on podcasts for the greater good because it's a moral obligation. So that became my motivation. That became not my kids, that became everyone's kids. Mm. And motivation is like a shower, you need it daily. And that's where my readers, God bless them, 
we all have down days. You wake up and I get an email from somebody in Ghana last week. I mean, countries that uh, I, I can't find on a map. I mean, my, my book's in, in Lithuania. This year it comes out in Croatian, in Icelandic, in Urdu. Uh, I'm, I'm humbled by this, but it gets me to move further. And I, I took out of all those letters, I took one and put them in Future Proofing You. I asked her permission because I, I, I cried with tears from it. A woman back your age, took all her money and set up Airbnbs, she's gonna make money, and she lost all her money. She was broke, 50, her kids are grown, it's out of the house, she feels no purpose, she feels like a loser. So she, she decides she's going to commit suicide. And she called her grown daughter to say goodbye. And her daughter's reaction shocked her. When she said she was gonna kill herself, her daughter laughed. Not in a mean, ha ha ha, go die, you're going to kill yourself over money? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And her daughter gave her Disrupt You, and she was writing me, tell me now she has a new successful business, and she's happy and alive and thriving. And I didn't do anything. She did the work. So all that I do is hold up a mirror to people. Self-disruption, disrupting yourself, is akin to being a sur getting plastic surgery, but you hold the scalpel. Everybody has it within it. Think of your favorite rock star, your favorite movie star, your favorite shirt, your favorite album, your favorite car, your favorite toy. Every one of those things was created by a stubborn person, a person who persevered and didn't give up. And I believe in everybody. Tom Bill Yu wrote the foreword to Future Proofing You, and in it he writes, I want the reader to know I believe in you. I don't have to know you, I know humans. And I know what humans are capable of. So, you know, let's embrace our humanity. Let's try to make the world better. Let's, if, 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 if and, you know, wealth is, is great. I want people to become successful. But if you really look between the lines in both my books, Disrupt You first teaches you how to change yourself so you can understand how to be successful. Then it shows you how to kick ass in, in the business world. But the third part of the book is now that you figured out that, why not raise your game and try to solve some big mm. world problems? Because if not you, who? And if not now, when? And, and it's amazing the innovative solutions that I'm watching come to solve global warming and the high prices of food. We're going to have massive food shortages globally. Um, and all these great things that, you know, it's the entrepreneur. It's not, no one's, no, no one owes you anything and no one's coming to, to, to save you. But you have it within yourself. That's one of the things I learned from Jeff Hoffman. Uh, there is no they. They should do something. There is no they. It's us. Uh, interviewed a guy named David Katz who, uh, who started Plastic Bank. And Plastic Bank, it was an idea was, what if we took trash from the ocean and had people make money from that? And now he's in all these third world countries where people are gathering trash and getting and bringing it to these banks to have money for medicine and cooking oil and all that stuff. And it was just came out of an idea after seeing all the trash in the ocean. And so what you're, what you're talking about, you are the definition of, you know, give, give a person a fish, you'll feed them for a day, teach them to fish, you'll feed them for the rest of your life. That's what you do every day, all day. And I'm just grateful that you uh, took the time to talk with us. And I, I thank you for being here. Oh, anybody that this is connected with that wants to start changing your life right now, there's free workbooks for both of my books, Disrupt You and Future Proofing You. Go to jsamit.com, J-A-Y-S-A-M-I-T.com. And you can start changing your life today. There's no upsell here. There's no, you know, you can't get a t-shirt with my face on it. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to put all these links in the show notes so that people okay. can can go do that. See your interviews with, with Tom, because I think those are actually really in-depth and really good if they want to understand what the books are about, because you did one for each one of the books, which is really great, and the workbooks and everything else. So thank you for doing this. Thank you. Keep up doing what you're doing. To everybody else, uh, your time and attention. This time, I brought you value. So now go do something with it. Let me know how I can help. I love you. Have a great rest of the day.